Thank you for joining the American Lung Association's webinar, Private Insurance and Tobacco Secession, an update. Today's webinar will be recorded and you can access it via the registration link or at www.long.org. Additionally, on today's webinar, all questions will be taken via the Q&A chat box. We encourage you to type in your questions throughout the webinar. And lastly, please take a couple of minutes at the end of the webinar to fill out the survey. It will help us develop future webinars and resources. I will now turn today's webinar over to Anne DiGiulio. Please go ahead. Thank you, Sia. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining us today for today's webinar, Private Insurance and Tobacco Cessation, an update. Um, we're really excited to share the great information we have. Um, and just a couple things, again, so the webinar will be recorded and it should be available within the next couple of days. Um, additionally, if you've got any questions during the webinar, please just type them into that Q&A box. We should have plenty of time at the end to really get to go over those questions and for you to hear from the different speakers that we have. Um, and then again, I will plug it at the end, but if you could please take a minute or two once the webinar is completed to fill out that survey, that will really help us to make sure that we can um, tailor new resources to everyone on the call and just in general. Um, so today I'd like to introduce our um, speakers. Um, as you can see, our pictures are up here. Um, so first, Claire Brockbank. Um, Claire Brockbank is the founder of Segway Consulting, a healthcare strategy and business development firm. She gained her broad perspective on healthcare through her work for the U.S. Congress and state governments with national and local insurance carriers and health plans, and as an executive within an employer coalition in several healthcare startups. In addition to the American Lung Association, Claire is working with the Centers for Disease Control and multiple state governments to identify and analyze coverage and reimbursement of services compatible with the nation's public health care agenda and using information to promote mutually beneficial health and wellness strategies between health and private carriers. Claire has a longstanding relationship with the National Alliance for Health Care Purchaser Coalition to track and promote value-based purchasing strategies, including tobacco cessation and support. Claire received an MS in Health Policy and Management from Harvard University and her undergraduate graduate degree from Stanford University. Um, I'm also joined today by Amanda Jansen, who is the Senior Public Affairs Manager at Clearway, Minnesota, an independent nonprofit working to reduce tobacco harm. Amanda works to advance local and statewide tobacco prevention and cessation policies using grassroots organizing, direct lobbying, and public relations. She also has extensive experience in state-level implementation of healthcare reform initiatives, including leading efforts to increase access to tobacco dependence treatment for all Minnesotans. Since joining the organization in 2010, Amanda has worked with health systems, employers, community-based organizations, and other statewide par partners to collaboratively, collaboratively pass and implement strong public health policies. Um, and then in addition, you have me, Anne DiGiulio. I'm the National Director of Lung Health Policy here at the American Lung Association. Um, I direct two federal um, projects funded by CDC, one to collect tobacco cessation coverage data in state Medicaid programs, and one to provide technical assistance on both tobacco cessation coverage and all types of insurance in Medicare and Medicaid, as well as um, technical assistance on health systems change in tobacco cessation. So feel free to, all of our email addresses will be up at the end. So uh, if you've got questions, please feel free to email us. Um, and now I'm going to just give everybody a quick overview, and then I'll turn it over to Claire. So today we're going to be talking about kind of why in general we are interested in private insurance. Um, kind of what the changing landscape of private insurance is. Um, we're going to look at some really cool data that Claire has worked on called the Evaluate Data. Um, and then Amanda's going to share her experience um, with private insurers and actually self-insured insurers in Minnesota. And then we're going to have a lot of time for questions at the end. So um, with that, Claire, I'm going to turn it over to you. And I will advance to the next slide, which is actually a polling question. So the question is, um, do you think there are more tobacco users in Medicaid, Medicare, or private insurance? And if you all could just pick one, we'll start to see some results, and that will help um, inform the rest of the discussion this afternoon. Okay, so um, that's terrific. What we see here is that most of you think there are more 
smokers in Medicaid than Medicare or private. Um, and that is why we're having this conversation today. So let's, um, so w let's look at what the, the reality is here. So what we see here is that, in fact, um, about half of U.S. smokers are covered by private insurance. So um, most of you probably base that on prevalence, which you would be completely accurate on. If you take a look at this table, um, although uh, only about 12% of the population with private insurance smoke or use tobacco, we cover so many people in the private market relative to the others. So you can see the prevalence in some of these other um, areas, including the highest rate of 28.4% for uninsured. But when you multiply those numbers out across how many people are covered, half of our smokers right now are covered by private insurance. And so um, that's why it's important to keep, keep paying attention um, to our private tobacco users. Now, we're not saying that you should stop paying attention to Medicaid or some of the areas where you have really high prevalence in some of your disparate populations. So in that juggle, we are always short on enough resources and bandwidth. But one of the things to think about uh, when you want, you want to consider private, a private sector um, focus, either in addition to or instead of Medicaid, if Medicaid coverage is really good in your area and you've, you've wrestled that alligator and, and you're feeling pretty good about it, or if you're really bumping up against the stone wall um, with Medicaid and you're having a hard time, um, know that there is a large pool of tobacco users that you can still um, attend to. Um, many of you are working on health system integration work, and most of those systems will include both privately covered individuals and publicly covered, and so it's important to keep that in mind also. That's particularly relevant when you're looking at things like CHMAs and, and community needs assessments. Um, this is also a um, time to think about uh, state or public employee coverage because those fall into that private sector area. The last point is if you're focusing on some particular conditions. Um, so in private health care, often there's a lot of focus on um, diabetes or heart disease, substance abuse, et cetera, and it's important for you to be able to think about um, these are conditions that really drive cost in private coverage, and they are really impacted by tobacco use. So, again, um, the language might be different, but this is why when we, we know how many of our tobacco users are covered by private insurance, these same numbers are going to start to hold true with folks with diabetes, et cetera, and so the link between tobacco and um, these privately covered individuals can be made quite, quite readily. So that's the general case for why pay attention um, to private co people covered under private insurance. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Anne, and she's going to give you a little bit more of a sense of the lay of the land in private insurance coverage. Great. Thank you so much, Claire. And that's really great and really sobering numbers to hear. Um, so thank you for going through that with us. Um, so I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about what where we are with private insurance and how it's changed even in the last six months. Um, and so first, any time I do a presentation, and I apologize to those who have been on many presentations with me, I like to first talk about what we consider a comprehensive cessation benefit to be. Um, so when we look at a comprehensive benefit, it's composed of a co two different components. So we're looking at a benefit that covers all three types of counseling. So individual, which is that face-to-face -face counseling, group counseling, which is sometimes considered a class or a clinic, and then phone counseling, which can either be provided through a quit line or through an insurance company in this case or a Medicaid company's, um, you know, Medicaid program's relationship with the quit line or their own program. Um, in addition to that counseling, we're looking at coverage of all seven FDA-approved cessation medications. Those include five NRTs or nicotine replacement therapies. That's the gum, patch, lozenge, nasal spray, and inhaler as well as bupropion and varenicline. Um, and then I will go. We also look at different barriers to accessing cessation coverage. Um, the first thing that you may have noticed from the last slide is uh, three of those NRT medications are um, over-the-counter medications, the gum patch and the lozenge. However, to get those prescriptions without cost sharing, um, you do need that prescription for them. So all of these will need a prescription um, to get that medication. Um, but some common barriers that we see to access are cost sharing, so, um, you know, it's more than, you know, 
co-pays, co-insurance, or deductibles. Um, any sort of prior authorizations needed, um, duration limits, so you can only be on a medication for a certain amount of time, um, yearly or lifetime limits, so you can only um, attempt, you can only have so many quit attempts either per year or even in some cases per lifetime when you're on that insurance. Um, dollar limits, so we'll, that insurance company will only spend so many dollars on your quit attempt. Um, step care therapy, meaning that you have to try in one medication, try one medication and fail on that before you can try another one. And then lastly, um, require counseling, so the need to couple up cessation medications with counseling. And while we would encourage everybody to couple those together, we don't want that to become a barrier to make a quit attempt at all. So now I'm going to talk really quickly a little bit about some requirements within private insurance and kind of where the divisions lie. Um, so first and foremost, I think kind of looking at where pe how people are covered and how people get their health insurance. Um, so this, first of all, this graph that I have or this depiction I have is not to scale, so please don't, um, don't think it is. Um, you know, prior to the Affordable Care Act, we had a really big uninsured population. And it's dramatically decreased since the Affordable Care Act. Um, and so, um, you know, we know that people, um, private insurance smoke at a rate much less than people um, that have Medicaid. But still, we know that from Claire's slide that the people, the sheer number of people in private insurance smoke more. But more people have gotten coverage, so more people are able to get access to treatments that may not have been able to get access before. Um, again, and this also only looks at people under the age of 65. Um, one of the things that the Affordable Care Act did was require a number of different types of health insurance to um, provide coverage of preventive services without cost sharing. Um, and so that, and there's a number of plans that are supposed to cover those. So almost all private plans with the big asterisk, which we'll talk about in a minute, any health plan sold in the exchanges, um, almost any small group plan, any individual plan, um, any Medicaid expansion plans, and one of the newer plans, which are the association health plans, are required to cover these preventive services. Unfortunately, the group though, that's not, not required to cover these preventive services without cost sharing, um, that list has gotten bigger. Medicare has its own, or have its, has its own requirements, which happy to talk with anybody about that at a different time. Um, additionally, standard Medicaid plans, so anybody that would have been eligible to enroll in Medicaid prior to Medicaid expansion has a different set of requirements. Um, and then there's a number of new types of health care plans that we're going to be talking a little bit about today that are kind of additionally segmenting the marketplace and I think making it our job and the job that, you know, that some of the data that Claire is going to share with us later and some of that work that Amanda's done a little bit more difficult. And so those types of plans. Um, and those include grandfathered plans. And actually, it's really interesting. About 20% of employees um, that get their insurance through work have at least one grandfathered plan offered to them as an option for, have at least a grandfathered plan or a grandfathered plan offered to them as an option. So those are actually still more prevalent than I think most of us would have thought by now. Um, and then, you know, there's a number of different types of plans that we'll get to in a second. So what are preventive services now that I've talked about them a lot? Um, so the ACA requires a number of different plans that we've talked about in the last slide to cover preventive services with an A or a B grade from the United States Preventative Services Task Force with no cost sharing. And that is written into the law of the Affordable Care Act. That's no guidance. It's not rulemaking. That is in the law. Um, tobacco cessation has received an A grade, so it's supposed to be covered by a number of those plans without cost sharing. Um, so that is really great and has really improved, I think, the coverage of cessation um, around the country. And that does include all three forms of counseling and um, that, those seven medications. Um, in addition to kind of what that ACA requirement in the law is, um, the Departments of Labor, Health and Human Services, and Treasury um, about five years ago released guidance to say, hey, you know, this is what we actually mean by a comprehensive cessation benefit. And this is, what, this is how we are going to interpret what the preventive services requirement, what the USPSTF is saying, this is how we're going to put it into insurance word, regulate, insurance language. So I like to think of the FAQ as kind of a translator. And basically what they said is if you want to cover tobacco cessation, you've got to cover at least four sessions of individual group and phone counseling 
in at least 90 days of any FDA-approved medication when prescribed, with no cost sharing or no prior authorization, and that equals one quit attempt, and you have to cover at least two quit attempts a year. So that is kind of what the lay of the land is um, for those plans that have to cover it. Um, in September 2015, the USPSTF updated their recommendation. They do that every so often um, just to make sure what they're saying is correct. They reaffirmed the A grade for tobacco cessation. Um, they found that um, both counseling and pharmacotherapy are effective in helping smokers quit, and I think that's really important. Um, and the other thing that's really important is that for a number of these plans, um, at least for the fully insured plans, the states are the regulators. Um, for the self-insured plans, which we'll get to in a minute, that's regulated at the Department of Labor at that at the federal level. And as I said, we're now getting into those plans. So um, kind of private insurance, employer-sponsored insurance, which even within the private insurance market is the biggest chunk of it. Um, and so employers are responsible for making a lot of the decisions. Again, they can be fully insured or self-insured. Um, but with fully insured plans, um, the states are responsible for regulating, they're responsible for enforcing things that pre like preventive services are being complied with. Um, or there's self-insured plans, and self-insured plans, those are regulated by the Department of Labor, and those are a little bit harder to get into, and so that's why we're really excited to have Amanda share later kind of some of her work and how she talked and reached, um, reached across and worked with some of those self-insured plans. Um, there's definitely a trend towards those self-insured plans, which I think um, for those of us, you know, really I think that is, again, another important reason why Amanda's talking about with us later today. Um, and then geography really matters. I mentioned earlier, states can help the, the fully insured plans or the regulators of what is covered, you know, kind of making sure that after those plans are following the rules. And so, you know, I think, you know, where you're located matters, and so that's important too. The other big type of private insurance um, is the individual market. Um, the Affordable Care Act did a lot to make the individual market a lot easier for people to access. Um, not to say that health insurance is still unaffordable for a lot of people, because it really is, um, but there are a number of rating rules. Again, there's rules that these plans, at least in the state marketplaces, are required to cover those essential health benefits and preventive services are part of that. Um, there's premium assistance to help people at the lower end of the income scale afford coverage. Um, and then there's cost sharing subsidies, so people even at the lower end of that lower income scale can um, aren't exposed to some of the really high cost sharing that other people are. Um, there are new rules um, starting in June of 2018 around something called association health plans. Um, these plans, while they're required to cover the preventive services, which is really great, um, they're not required to cover the full suite of the essential health benefits. So it's a much more limited, these plans can be much more limited in scope, um, but they don't necessarily have to. There's kind of an unsure regulatory environment, and kind of depending on how they're designed, um, they're either regulated by the Department of Labor or by the State Insurance Commissioner. So it really does depend on, you know, kind of what, how it's designed. If it's, it, some of them can kind of be multi-state. You know, think of like, a, like um, I'm from Chicago. So think of the Chicago area. You could have people from northern Indiana and southern Wisconsin and Illinois all getting health insurance through the same plan. Um, or I live in D.C. now, so there are people that live in, you know, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia that all get insurance through the same plan. So that's kind of geogra geographically how you can have some variation in coverage and kind of where the regulation takes place. Another newer type of plan um, are short-term limited duration plans. Um, there were new rules that were promulgated in October of last year um, that really expanded these plans. Um, unfortunately, these plans have no kind of baseline of what they have to cover. They're allowed to medically underwrite, so that means charging premiums that are much higher for certain, for sicker people or older people, um, and subsidies cannot be used to buy these plans. However, states can regulate them or prohibit them, um, and a number of states have. Um, in addition, we're seeing more and more changes in private insurance. Um, one of the things that's kind of pushing this along um, is the repeal of the individual mandate, um, because, or the penalty in the individual mandate, I should say. Um, and that's just kind of allowing a new market for different types of insurance that, does it, that don't necessarily have to cover those essential health benefits or even things like preventive services. 
Um, additionally, there's been new guidance around um, some state innovation waivers that are called 1332 waivers. Um, these are waivers that a state can use to kind of change their in, um, private insurance market or their marketplace or their exchange. Um, basically, these waivers just give states more flexibility. So there's more flexibility to kind of go in whatever direction you want. Um, you can just define good and bad in your own terms. Um, but states just have a lot of more, lot more flexibility than they did previously. Um, and then a couple of other types of coverage that we're seeing that are popping up are um, both Farm Bureau plans and health sharing ministries. Um, Farm Bureau plans are happening in a number of states. Um, they're currently active in Iowa is probably the best example. Um, there are also some in Tennessee that have been existed prior to the Affordable Care Act and have continued to exist ever since. Um, these plans, unfortunately, have not had a good record of covering people with pre-existing conditions, um, and they're really outside of the regulatory sphere of the state insurance commissioner, which can be really problematic. Um, and then health sharing ministries are even, I think, one step farther. Um, these are tend to be faith-based groups, um, but the group decides, kind of, they all put money into a pot and then decide who to pay, what services they'll pay for. This is not a traditional insurance insurance product and is not necessarily um, part of any insurance company. So these are kind of separate and outside. But so I think there, we're seeing, again, more flexibility in what states can do, um, plans that states can't regulate and aren't regulating, and then plans that don't even really fall under the scope of insurance. Um, we'll go to the next slide and kind of what does all of this mean? Um, so I think one of the things that we've seen is, you know, more coverage of cessation treatment overall. Um, some studies are showing that um, not all plans are covering what they're supposed to be covering. Um, one of the things I think is this information is kind of confusing and you really have to dig down to find it. Um, I think a lot of times people don't necessarily know what benefits and this new level of detail that are required and that they should have. Um, some states are working with state insurance commissioners, and some state insurance commissioners are really taking a more aggressive approach to making sure things like tobacco cessation coverage and other preventive services are being covered the way they should be. Um, other states are taking a more hands-off approach. So I think all I have to say is there's more work to be done, and we're going to hear about some great tools from Claire and some um, great strategies from Amanda. So Claire, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you, Anne. Um, one thing that's important to be wary of with the the, the faith-based or the sharing ministries that Ann talked about is that many of them have morality clauses, and so you sign saying that you don't do anything like drink or smoke or do drugs, and most people sign those without thinking anything of it. But that's particularly problematic with tobacco use because we know so many um, so many things, diseases and conditions come from use of tobacco that could then be deemed not covered. So just a heads up on that. Uh, so we're going to switch. And so Anne has given this great sense of how all the options are on private coverage, but I'm going to talk now about how do what what actually is private coverage um, including in terms of tobacco cessation. Um, this is a partnership between um, the Centers for Disease Control, Office of Smoking and Health, and the National Alliance of Healthcare Purchaser Coalitions. Those are employer coalitions around the country. Um, we're looking at data from two years, 2016 and 2017. Um, to get an, a fairly detailed set of questions regarding how do you cover tobacco cessation. Um, they come from Evaluate, as Ann mentioned earlier, which is a survey of health plans. Um, collectively, those plans um, for whom we have the, this data represent uh, 90 million uh, lives. So that, if you sort of back it up, it's about – um, almost 60% of um, American adults who are not on Medicare or Medicaid. So it's a big chunk. And so uh, while it, it isn't perfect, it gives you a pretty darn good feel. Um, we're going to talk about national plans and regional plans. Nationals are those big ones that you know about, the Aetna, Cigna, Anthem, that you know are all over the country. And the regionals are those ones that are typically um, confined to a particular area. And we look at differently because the results are a little bit different. So these are the areas that um, this tool covers. We're going to focus mostly on the actual we learned about coverage, but we'll we'll reference some of these other areas, provider support, et cetera. There and there is information in there if you're interested that can be shared. It's just not necessarily what we'll focus on today. 
So first of all, as Anne laid out in terms of the required coverage, counseling. So this is the good news. Counseling benefits, um, are they just keep improving, and um, which is good. What we see now is that um, plans, for the most part, really embed coverage for individual counseling in both their insured and self-insured plans. And, and um, the reason we care about the difference between those is that, uh, is that some of the self-insured plans are more likely to be grandfathered. So when they say they're embedding it, it means they offer it, even though they're not necessarily required to. And it's not something the employer can decide he or she doesn't want to include. Um, that's great because if a doctor sees you with a card that says, let's say, um, United Healthcare, they don't know whether that card represents a self-insured person or an insured person. It kind of looks the same to them. So the more consistent we see this coverage, the better. So, so in-person counseling. Telephone counseling um, is not quite as deeply embedded, but it's pretty good. Um, it's, uh, it's embedded by all the regional plans. They're often a little bit better at coverage. Um, and by half of the four national plans. So not quite as pervasive. Many of the national plans still assume the quit line will cover, um, cover everybody, but not bad. Um, the good news is that um, we found very few exceptions to the guideline in terms of at least two courses of treatment and, um, and the guideline with respect to how many sessions and the duration of the session. So the coverage as it's offered is fairly compliant um, with, with those clinical guidelines. So the, and we're going to come back to group coverage. So, so we know counseling is one piece and drug coverage is another. So again, we see um, really embedded coverage for um, pharmacotherapy on the national plans across the insured and self-insured. So that is fantastic news. Um, some of the national plans um, make you do a buy-up, which means you pay a little more for the option to add um, Varenicline, which is Chantix. So not quite as accessible on the Chantix front, but that's it. Um, regionals, not, this is one area where they're not quite as good, but they typically um, embed their coverage, but some of them are saying to the employer, you can decide if you want to buy, pay more to have coverage for both Chantix and Bupropion. So that's a little bit of a barrier. Um, when we talk to those regional plans, they say it's because a lot of the employers have their own, have different pharmacy relationships, those self-insured, and they don't, they don't really want the regional plans covering it because it's duplicating coverage that the, those large employers already have from their national ones. Many national employers will offer a regional and a national plan side by side. So it may not be as restrictive as we think. Um, Here's the really good news. Anne identified one of the barriers um, to coverage as that requirement to get, have, go through counseling to get medications, you know, linking requirements. And while we know the guideline says we have better outcome results, it also says don't, don't, don't require that. So um, this has been an area we've worked on, and we saw none of the, all of the plans have gotten rid of that requirement which is great. And only one, the smallest of the regional plans, has that requirement. So that's been great progress. So we see that barrier being less and less prevalent. So the third leg of a three-legged stool, if you will, is um, what about the member financial requirements, right? Because it's supposed to be free. Um, so uh, big improvement from the first year we looked at this data, um, all of the plans provide their counseling benefits at no cost, and all of them waive the deductible, which is exactly how it should be. Um, none of the plans have a copay for tobacco, for the drugs, the medications, but some do still have deductible requirements. So that means that um, it's free, but if you have a $1,000 deductible, it's only free after you've hit your $1,000 deductible. Um, so that's a, that's a problem. Um, so... Um, and we saw that for one of the national plans and two of the regionals. So um, th this is one area where it is not in compliance with the federal requirement that you be exempt from cost sharing for USPSTF um, recommended treatment services. So coverage is better, but that is still a barrier. Okay, 
what are some of the big gaps that we see? So mostly that's been fairly good news, right? We have much better coverage. Um, we've got, gotten rid of a lot of the requirements linking counseling and medication. For the most part, people can access a, um, some form of pharmacotherapy free of charge. Here's our gaps. Um, group counseling. And that just continues to be the most prevalent gap. And I would say my, that's on the private side. I would say on my work on the public sector side, it is also the biggest um, in public sector coverage too. So it, is, it is just continues to be a gap. Um, one of the things that we're really disappointed to see is that a lot more plans have added pharmacy restrictions, like you have to get a prior authorization or you have to try um, let's say NRT before you can get to bupropion or Chantix or things like that, limiting um, the number of fills you can have. But I have to tell you that is perfectly legal within the ACA. The ACA, the Affordable Care Act, and um, allows plans to use medical management, and these would be considered medical management. We want to make sure before you use the most expensive drug, we've tried something else. Um, or you can only get the drugs if you go to your covered pharmacy. You can't go anywhere. But those are all, they're legitimate. They're not things we like, but they are legitimate. Okay. And I think I already covered that one. Looks like that got in twice. So some takeaways. Um, in general, what we see is that uh, almost all privately covered individuals, so that's about half of our smokers, um, are likely to have access to one or more kinds of tobacco cessation counseling. So it depends on glass half full or half empty, whether that's good news or inadequate news. Um, most of them have very minimal restrictions in terms of being able to access counseling. Most privately covered individuals have access to multiple forms of pharmacotherapy. Um, but they are not likely to have access to all of them, and they are very likely to encounter restrictions in terms of how many times they can fill those prescriptions and, and what kind of authorizations they might need in order to, um, to gain access to their coverage. So the, the, I'm going to ask a question, and it's going to help us, I think, as we move forward and think about next steps, and that's, um, is it a glass half full or a glass half empty when we look at it as, is it positive that most privately covered individuals have access to some form of counseling and multiple forms of pharmacotherapy? Or do you still see it as negative that not all forms of counseling and pharmacotherapy are consistently covered? If you can click your responses. So as these come in, we'll take a look at it. I think it's interesting. Most of the plans feel it's really positive, that they've really stepped it up, that if you use tobacco, there is a way for that, you to quit on their coverage. Um, and they, they get a little, a little peeved when you say, but it's not complete. So it's something we really need to tackle. Um, I would say the bigger barrier now is that even in those plans that have really great coverage, um, members don't know about it. They're not identifying their tobacco users and they're not promoting it. So the work that um, Amanda's going to talk about is really important because it's really looking at how do you actually um, make this benefit well utilized. So with that, Amanda, can I turn it over to you? Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Claire. So I'm going to spend a few minutes talking through my experience working on improving cessation benefits with two large self-insured employers in Minnesota. Uh, so Minnesota has a lot of self-insured employers. These are a select few. 40% um, of Minnesotans are covered by a self-insured plan, meaning that 40% of our residents have widely varying cessation benefits based on what Ann was saying before about where we're seeing uh, variation in coverage. Um, so we knew we wanted to try to close coverage gaps for these Minnesotans, but also knew that there wasn't really a systematic way to engage with all of these employers at once. Um, so we were forced to prioritize and chose the University of Minnesota and Minnesota State employees. So we chose these two employers for different reasons. First, uh, for the university, we chose them because they're a well-respected employer in our state. Um, if they would have a comprehensive benefit, we could hold them up as an example. 
Um, we also had an existing relationship. So um, a meeting with the right people was low-hanging fruit. Uh, second, the State Employee Group Insurance Program, or CGIP. Uh, the state is the second largest employer in Minnesota with just over 40,000 employees. Um, they're second only to the Mayo Clinic, who has just a couple, 1,000 or so more employees. Um, it was an opportunity for us to set an example for other employers across the state. Um, we also had an opportunity to make the case of implementing the Affordable Care Act consistently across state agencies in Minnesota. So across our Medicaid program, um, our state insurance regulators that were looking at uh, the individual and small group markets, um, as well as uh, the large group markets. We also um, knew that working with the state employees would have broader reach to other public, public employees across the state. Um, so we have a different insurance program called the Public Employee Insurance Program that covers employees of Minnesota cities or townships and counties and school districts and other units of local government. And if you, uh, any changes that you make to the CGIP, the state employee benefits, um, roll over into the other public employee insurance programs. So our reach would be pretty large if we could make changes there. So there are two main things that we leveraged when working with these self-insured employers. First, the ACA requirements. Anne already shared much of this, so I won't go into the specifics again. Um, but we know these ACA requirements do apply to non-grandfathered insurance plans. And in Minnesota, we actually have fewer grandfathered plans than typical because we have many ever-changing state-based insurance requirements. So when the plans are updated to reflect changes in state-based insurance requirements, a lot of them have lost their grandfathered status. Um, so, but we also know that even if you're not grandfathered and you have to comply with the ACA, that the requirement to cover a comprehensive benefit is, uh, for lack of a better term, self-enforced, and there's not a lot of teeth behind that. Um, so we also know that the self-insured market is where we see the most variability in insurance coverage, even several years after the ACA first started being implemented. Um, the last thing that was a key here is we know that many third-party administrators or the health plans that administer coverage for self-insured employers in Minnesota weren't telling their clients, so the U or the state, that tobacco dependence treatment had to be covered under their health insurance benefits. They weren't carrying that message, so we had an opportunity to do so. We also look to make the business case for treating tobacco, de tobacco dependence. So we know that tobacco cessation has a great return on investment. We also know that tobacco use costs employers a lot of money. Um, for example, each smoker costs their employers nearly $6,000 more each year. That means if I'm a large employer and I have 100 smokers, I'm spending $600,000 more each year simply because they're smokers. And even for a small employer that has just five smokers, would spend $30,000 more a year. We also have other research in Minnesota from Blue Cross and Blue Shield that says that smoking costs Minnesotans $7 billion each year in healthcare costs and lost productivity. Um, so we calculate that out to be $593 for every person living in our state regardless of whether or not they themselves smoke. So the cost piece was really important going in to be able to make the case that this is costing your business and our communities a lot of money. So given the two main leverage points, the ACA and the business case, we started planning our outreach to both the university and the state. So our process for doing outreach in both of these places um, was similar and just had slight nuances. Um, but it looks something like this. We looked at uh, what the benefits currently were and set goals on where we'd like to move them. We asked ourselves, was a comprehensive benefit possible or do we need to look at more incremental change? We also made sure we understood the process for designing and changing benefits so that we could understand when to time our outreach and when our ask um, was the most uh, ripe, if you will. We then identified key stakeholders or decision makers in order to make sure the right people were at the right meetings. We weren't wasting anyone's time or waiting unnecessarily for others to bring this information back to the actual decision makers in their organizations. We also developed our messaging and rationale for these changes using the ACA, our business case data. We have other resources like a return on investment fact sheet and a lot, uh, when it came to the ACA, a lot of the good resources that the American Lung Association has. And then we had our meeting where we provided 
information, discussion on different options, and kind of made our ask on what we wanted those folks to do. And then we, became the lo we began the longest part of the process, which was following up on all of our discussions over and over again um, to make sure that we saw results. And in one case, we were able to help with implementation. So on to kind of where, where we landed. One was successful, one not so much. Um, so for the state employees, we were able to make the case for consistency across state agencies, like I was saying. Um, our Medicaid program removed co-pays, unsuscitation medications because of the ACA. Um, so we said if they're doing that in the Medicaid agency, we should also do the same thing for state employees. Um, and then our insurance commissioner was also ensuring that our small group plans were in compliance with the ACA as far as counseling goes. So we were able to make the case that state employees should be doing the same thing. Um, so arguing for that internal consistency was a key part of making this change happen for the state employees. For the University of Minnesota, we weren't as successful, likely for a few reasons. First, staff turnover. We had to start over from square one a few different times because different people were in new roles across the university. Um, second, the U has an expansive employee wellness program um, in addition to their health insurance benefits, which is great, um, except their employee wellness program offers phone counseling so they didn't feel like their health insurance benefits also had to offer phone counseling. So they were really concerned about duplicating rather than focusing on um, making sure that smokers have as many resources that they, as they have in different places no matter where they wanted to access them. Um, finally, for the U, the health plan that was administering their benefits wasn't communicating the ACA requirements to the university in the same way we were. Um, so the university ultimately trusted the advice of their TPA over ours which happens. So I think the main takeaway, takeaway from all of this is that there's really good information out there for you to use when trying to improve benefits, and there's a solid process that can be adapted to different employers in different states. Um, and at the end of the day for us, it was about doing strategic, well-timed outreach and setting realistic expectations on the progress we could make with the resources that we had. Um, and with that, I think I'll turn it back over to Anne. Thanks, Amanda, and thanks, Claire. You guys did really, really great information, and congratulations again um, on everything you've been able to do, Amanda. Um, we do have a few questions that have come in. Um, so, and again, I would encourage everybody to, if you've had a question or you know something, to please feel free to type it into the um, the chat Q and A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, it's right should be right. Um, at the very bottom right above your um, kind of where you see the internet and whatnot. Um, so if you've got a question, please type it in and we'll go for this. We'll go, we'll go through them. Um, so I'm going to just start. So our first question is, um, do you have any recommendations for how someone could get an idea of what, which cessation services a plan covers in their state? Um, and so um, I'm happy to start and then uh, Claire, I can kick that over to you if that would be okay. Um, so great. there's a number, yeah. So there are a number of different ways to kind of go about it. Um, some plans, so some private insurance plans, um, and some private companies, especially if they've got a self-insured plan, are going to consider um, that the plan is that that information on their formulary is proprietary information. You're going to have a really hard time finding it. Um, most Medicaid programs have their formularies public, so that's easy. But that's not what we're really talking about today. Um, so that's one way to do it. State employee health plans typically have their formularies that are covered. Um, and then most of the big insurance carriers are going to have um, kind of some of their what I call generic formularies that are going to be online. So if you go to like um, unitedhealthcare.com or, um, you know, Cigna.com, you can kind of find what their general overarching formulary is. Um, now figuring out which formulary that in, that in, that private plan that you're working with is using can be a little bit more tricky. Um, and so, Claire, you might have um, some better information on kind of how to figure it out. Um, sure. So if, you're, if you happen to be um, in a state where you have an employer coalition participating in this Evaluate, um, then you can get their results. And so that's like your best, your best you know, option because those results will be health plan specific. Um, 
So that would be one thing, and and um, I can send a link to Anne that she can circulate out if you want to go go find that the list of where Evaluate is done. Um, otherwise, Anne talked about formulary, but you can also you also want to look at counseling, right? Um, and really, honestly, the probably the best way to do it is to survey the plans. And I know that OSH is um, in the final stages. I don't know if we have anyone from OSH on the phone. In the final stages, we developed um, a, a survey that can be used um, to ask plans a number of things. It's a long survey, and it's meant for you to pick and choose the questions that are most relevant to the work you're doing. Um, we can follow up with them also in terms of finding out when that's going to be released. Um, and, and that's probably your most thorough way to do it. Um, you can also, you can look on the marketplace on your exchange, either at the federal government's healthcare exchange or the one in your own state. And those plans have to identify their coverage. And so um, you can find some of that out. It's a little bit of a needle in the haystack if you're trying to do it on your own, which is really why Amanda stressed that even with all those self-insured Companies, they had to tackle them, you know, sort of uh, one at a time, if you, or two at a time in this case. But and I can add one more thing. Um, yep. In Minnesota, and I don't know how comparable it is to other states. Any um, plan that has submitted to state regulators for review every year, um, that plan's information, it, at least in Minnesota, is published online, and some of the checklists for what the regulators did. Um, some of that information is online. Uh, for us, it's uh, within where our insurance commissioner is. So for us, that's our Department of Commerce. Some of that is public online. It is a lot of things to sift through. Um, so right. Finding, finding, finding partners in, we've had success finding partners in state agencies who maybe were part of the review process that we can start conversations with. They can help us sift through some of that and help us understand their process, which opens a regulatory policy window um, for you it, while also getting you some information on kind of lay of the land. Yeah, you're, and that's a really good point that the insurance commissioner is a really great um, person to tackle, especially to work with, to help tackle especially those fully insured state, those fully insured private plans. Yeah, and Amanda's right. There is, you can always go look at the state, the filings have to be public. So if I'm Anthem, um, and I'm going to sell a product, I have to, an insured product, which again is going to be typically less than half of what's being sold, probably closer to, you know, maybe 40%. Um, they have to file what the benefits are um, for those things. But I think to Amanda's sifting and sorting thing, even in the individual market in Colorado, there's probably a hundred different rate filings. Um, and so it's a lot to go through. Great. Um, so just a couple of things before we move on to the next question. So somebody just asked if we can confirm that prescriptions are required for reimbursement purposes. And so for, it's, yes. So for any plan, for any, even the over-the-counter medications, for the insurance company to know that you're getting the medication and get the, the patients getting it and that they should be paying for it, you need that prescription there. So that is needed regardless, um, kind of, wherever, you know, you know, whichever plan you're in, um, and for any medications, even if they are over-the-counter medications, so that is another piece of that promotion and education that is needed. Um, okay, so our next question I'm going to send to Claire, and it says, what recommendations or processes do you have on providing financial incentives to prescribers and pharmacies to improve the utilization of services and health outcomes? In other words, pay for performance. So we've asked about this on a number of occasions, and the issue here is that typically the plans want to do a pay for performance or an incentive type program for something that they're getting measured on also. So for a measure that's part of the National Committee on Quality Assurance or that's part of something they have to report as part of this, or there's all sorts of different public measures, many of which have a small tobacco component. But we but we have had no luck getting them to just from scratch, if you will, um, work financial incentives specifically for tobacco. Um, and that's really discouraging. Some have it as 
of a bundle of services and it, and you have like a choice of 10 things you can check off and tobacco is one of them but it has been very difficult for plans it's too small a piece of what they generally care about the pharmacies is a little bit of a different service but this is a state specific question because um, in many states, you, the pharmacists aren't allowed to, they can fill a prescription, but they're not allowed to um, do, they have varying degrees of power, right, ability to actually assist a tobacco user who's seeking assistance. So first, you'd want to look at um, what your rules allow you to do in your state with respect to pharmacy and tobacco, um, and, and then you could consider. Um, thinking about an incentive program around fills um, or around, again, depending on what the pharmacists are allowed to do. But it has been, it's, it's just pretty darn difficult to um, go there for prescribing. Great. Because That's it's really part of those quality oh. measures. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, Amanda, the next question is actually for you. Um, and we have somebody who's, ask, who's asking how long of a process it took for you working with um, the State Employee Health Department in Minnesota as well as the University of Minnesota? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I'm trying to think back because it was a while ago and the answer is it was long. So the University of Minnesota um, started and stopped so many times that um, it probably took a couple months for us to kind of do that assessment part of the process for both of them to assess what are the benefits and where are opportunities and what are the timelines and really kind of get our ducks in the row to actually hit go on outreach. That part took a couple months. And then um, for the U, it took a few different years and a few different meetings and we're still where we are and they haven't changed much. For the state, um, I think we had a couple meetings over the course of the year, leading of the course of a year leading up to when they were going to publish their summary of benefits, um, which because it's state employees is kind of a publicly facing document. And then we turned implementation looks like editing that summary of benefits with them and working with them on language and including the ACA. So the state employees was a little quicker, maybe a year and a half total from start to finish. But I will say that that was surprisingly fast for us. I was surprised at how receptive they were. And like I mentioned, one of the only reasons that it went that fast is because we already had two other state agencies that were implementing the Affordable Care Act, and the state employees benefit stuck out like a sore thumb as just one of these, these things is not like the other. Um, so yeah, it, it will vary widely. Great. Thanks, Amanda. Um, does anybody, if you have additional questions, please feel free to type them in, and I'll give everybody a minute to do that. While I'm giving you a minute to type in any additional questions, I want to make it in one more plug. Um, after the webinar is over, you'll receive an email thanking you for attending and providing a link to a survey. We would really encourage you to fill out that survey. Um, the Lung Association continues to provide webinars and create resources, and we want to make sure that they're helpful and exciting and interesting to all of you. Um, so filling out that survey will um, help us do that. Um, and so we do have another question, so that's great, so that worked. Um, so it's, um, as state tobacco programs look for ways to sustain tobacco quitline services, who in your opinion should start um, the conversations with health plan and employers, um, the state tobacco program or the state quitline vendor? Um, so um, Amanda, or I know you've had some experience in this, would you be interested in taking a stab at it or Claire? If not, I'm happy to have a conversation. Sure. Yeah. Amanda, you go first, and then I'll follow. Yeah, that sounds good. So we are actually in a unique situation where we're moving a bill through our legislature right now to fund uh, quitline services because the services that we have offered are going away soon because Clearway, Minnesota is ending soon. So um, that process, we have it, – it's more of a legislative turn to it, but I would say the biggest – uh, learning is there is never uh, too many voices at the table. So um, I think having the tobacco control program start conversations with health plans and employers I think is helpful. I think if the quitline vendor can chime in, that's great. We haven't really used our current quitline vendor to chime in at all and help with our efforts. Um, but what we have been focused on is making sure that the decision makers at the state have been hearing from 
health plans who say this is really important and here's why, and heard from community-based organizations and provider groups and everyone who uses the services being able to articulate how important they are, that's what we have found the most success in thus far at least. I guess we'll see how successful it is at the end of May to see if they pass funding for it. So I would say it depends a little bit on whether you're looking at how your quitline services, um, what kind of sustainability are you looking for? Is it just you know, continued state funding to provide access to everybody, or is it, um, it so it depends on who the quitline gives access to at this point in time. Um, the other one that it, that is important is Medicaid, because the odds are that you haven't mentioned, and the odds are the Medicaid um, program is using the quit line. They, they may or may not be paying for it, but I suspect if you track um, your usage, um, a pretty high percentage is, is Medicaid. Um, one of the things that we found successful in some states is that having the quit line really tracking who the carriers are, and sometimes that means really cleaning up that list of carriers because it, that, that's an overlooked thing. So you'll look at, you know, if you, a person calls in and they say, do you currently have insurance, and try to find out where what the carrier is. Those carrier lists will be 10 years old, and there's been tons of changes. But if you can find out that um, you had X thousand or X percent or some number to quantify of their people use the quit line services and you've given them that access, it makes them realize that they get something out of it. So again, if you're asking them to pay, it's one question. If you're asking them just to say it's a huge resource and, and they have access to it too. Um, but the more data you can try to find for all those different populations that Amanda just talked about, you know, getting them all on the bandwagon to make it real to them that the quit line provides value to them and their members, the better off you'll be. Great. Thank you, Claire and Amanda. And thank you so much for joining the webinar. And I noticed that we're at the top of the hour, so we will end it. But again, thank you so, so much, Claire and Amanda, for joining us. Um, our contact information is on the screen. So if you've got any questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, and don't forget to take that survey. And again, the webinar will be recorded. So if you would like to share it with colleagues, you can do that. Thank you so much. And um, have a great day. Sia, I'll turn it back over to you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for participating in today's conference call. You may now disconnect.